And I'll just say this because I say it at the beginning of every lecture. I record this and this will be posted on my YouTube channel for other SNHU students to view. So I'm going to share my screen. This week we are talking about Module 3, which is Decisions and Branching. So what are decisions and branching? They're really the way you start to write algorithms in any language. What do I mean by an algorithm? An algorithm is a series of commands that you write in a program, in our case it will be Python, that do something. Now we've done some of that in the past, but we haven't been able to ask Python to make a decision yet. And this is where the power of programming really comes in. We want, based on the data that we give it, the program to make a decision for us and act on that decision. So that's what branches are. Because basically your code is running and then it comes to a decision point and it will do one of two things. Because there's only two answers for a question when you ask it in Python, true or false. It can't have it. There's nothing in between for the for Python. Some programming languages do fuzzy logic. Python does not. So how do we ask a question to Python? Well, we have some new keywords. Now, keywords are just words, specific words that have meaning to Python. So in this case, the keywords are if, elif, and else. And they are how you ask a question to, Py to Python. So, um, whoops, sorry about that. So a branch is a path. So let me do this. I'm going to ignore this. This is I was writing some Python code because I'm trying to use Watson. So that's what you see on this screen but I'm going to create a new project. Uh, Python, should have done this earlier, sorry. Um, pure Python. Okay, this window. Don't know why it does that. I'm just going to create a Python file. I'm going to say simple if. So if I want to write a program, let's just say I'm going to have um, name please input your name. And then um, I want to do something based on, let's say, the length of the name. I'm going to use the if keyword because I'm making a decision here. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check that name has a length greater than zero. If, and we know what the how to do the length of a string. If len name is greater than zero. Um, sorry. And now this is not code that you would actually worry about, but this is just to demonstrate a few things. So what is this? This is, this is, these are decisions and branching. So all I am doing here is I'm saying input a name, just some kind of a name. Then based on the length of the name, I'm going to do something. I am either going to print you have a long name or you have no name. So how does Python understand what to do? Python understands what to do because the way in which I'm asking the question can only have one of two answers, true or false. So the length of name 
can either be zero or something else. Sorry. Um, if it's greater than zero, we're going to do one thing. So let me run this really quick and I'll show you. Uh, hold on. Let me add a configuration. Shell. So if I run this in the debugger, excuse me, I have to configure the interpreter. So if I have to, if I run this in the debugger, and I'm doing this on purpose, I want to step through it so you guys can see what happens. So the first thing I'm going to do is step over the input statement. And so right now it's waiting for me to input a name. And I'm going to input Lisa. And then I'm going to step over again. And you will see when we go to the debugger that name is Lisa. Therefore, the length has to be greater than zero. It's going to print out you have a long name. And then it's going to end the program. You'll notice it did not go and hit the else. And it did not go and hit the second print statement. And that is because these are mutually exclusive. If I make it into line four, I'm never going to let make it to line six because if and else are mutually exclusive. So I don't feel like I'm explaining things really well tonight, and I apologize for that. Um, let's go down. So the if statement Let me start again. If is a statement. So if I look at this statement, what do I see? I see two parts of the statement. I see the keyword if. And then I see the thing that I am trying to make a decision about. And that is basically the part of the statement that is asking the question and is expecting a true or false. Then I see a colon. The colon is very important. Why is the colon important? Well, the colon tells Python to that, that the question is complete. Just like when we write a sentence out and we put a question mark at the end of it, we know that that's the, that, that's the whole question. The way Python knows that is we put a colon. A colon is the stopping place, so it's not looking for anything else. And then what Python will do is it will say, if the length of name is greater than zero, do what's in the code block. So line four is a code block. And I know this because it is indented at one under the if. Now that's important. Python is a language that is case and space delimited. What that means is, that from a space perspective, you have to do indents to say that this is a code block. Some languages have semicolons. Some languages have other delimiters. Python is a space delimited language. So let me give you an example using the simple if. Line four just worked. We just saw it work. If I back up and I attempt to run this program again. So the only thing I did was on line four, I removed the tab. So it is now left justified. If I attempt to run this program, I'm going to get this little thing down here called an indentation error. That is because the minute Python sees an if, it's expecting underneath that if, that there will be one line, at least one line, indented to the right. And that didn't happen. And so that's what an indentation error is, because Python is not getting what it expected. What, is, what it is expecting is that. Now, one of the reasons I'm saying this is because this is one of the biggest mistakes I see new programmers do in Python. They don't understand why their if statements aren't working, and their if statements are fine. Their indentation is off. So 
So line four and any other line underneath it is a code block. And this code block right here only gets executed when the length of name is greater than zero. So when this, when line three evaluates to true, I'll do line four and then line five. And however many lines there are, that a block of code can be as many lines as it needs to be. So what about this else statement here? Else says, when all else fails, do this. So the if statement was false. Else is what it will fall to if the if statement is false. Now in this example, it's, it, it doesn't really make as much sense, but when we, especially when we start to get into LIF statements, which allow you to basically have question after question after question, all mutually exclusive, then it becomes more important. But let me show you what happens, and I'm going to do it in a debugger again, to get to the ELF. Whoops. What in the world is it doing? Okay, so I'm in the debugger. I'm going to step over one. I'm at the console. I'm going to input my name, and I'm just going to hit the enter. So if I look at the debugger, the name is empty. So the length of name should not be greater than or equal to zero. And you will see what happened. It did not go to line four. It did not go to line five. It went right to line seven. Now it went right to line seven because this was false. The length of name is not greater than zero because it didn't enter anything. So that's what happened because of the else statement. So it skipped over 4 and 5, and then it went to 7, because we're saying in case the length of name is 0 or less, do this. So that's the difference between if and else, and that's what I mean by mutually exclusive. It's also what I mean by a code block. So is everyone good with that? Is that is that reasonably understandable? Okay, I'm going to assume. Okay, thank you, Gabrielle, for saying yes. I appreciate that. Thank you, Clifford. Thank you, Valerie. I appreciate that. So when, how, how do you ask, well, let's do this. Let's go to more if else. Actually, um, multi-branch if-else statements, print century. Let us, well, let me ask you guys this question real quick. Are there any challenges or labs you want to get to tonight? Because if there are, I'll make sure that we get to them and review them. We won't do the entire, I won't give you the solution, but we will get to them and do them. So go ahead and put in the chat if there's a particular uh, challenge or lab that you want to get to. So um, let me go back and see something for a second. Basic if else. So write an if else statement for the following. If user tickets is less than five, assign one to num tickets, else, oh, okay. 3.13. Okay, we'll make sure to get to 3.13. We'll do this one really quick just so that we know what it's doing. And then we'll go and keep going and we'll make sure we do 3.13. Okay. So let's take this and copy it in to here. And this is what is it? It is 323. Three. Okay, so I'm just going to create a comment and I'm going to grab the input statement that they gave us.
And we'll just go through this really quick. So what are they asking? They're saying write an if-else statement for the following. If user tickets is less than five, assign one to the number of tickets, else assign user tickets to the num tickets. Okay? So the sample output with an input of three is the number of tickets one, and that's because user tickets is less than five. So they're already giving us user tickets. So basically what we need to do is we need to create a variable called num tickets. Now I'm doing this outside the uh, if block for a reason. And I'll show you that reason in a minute. So I'm saying num tickets is zero. I'm just setting it to zero. And then I'm saying if. It says if user tickets is less than five. So if user tickets is less than five, then what do I want to do? I want to assign one to the num tickets is one. Else I want to assign user tickets to num tickets. So this is this is the mutual exclusion that we were talking about. And what we have is we have it's very simple. It's very much like the the name length I did. The difference is that I put num tickets up here. Why is that? Well, I'll show you. Let's just run this really quick. Just going to make it part of the configuration. And first of all, I'm just going to put in two. And the value of dumb tickets is one. That's completely fine. I'm going to run it again to check my code. I'm going to put in six. And the value of numtickets tickets is six. So this is correct. Now, how could I make it incorrect? I'm going to right now just take out line 12. Just take it out. And then I'm going to run it again. And we already saw it work. Now, value of num tickets is one. Okay. I didn't break it. I thought I was going to break it. Okay. Never mind. Ignore what I just said. Yeah, nor what I just said. Thinking in Java for a minute. I apologize when I do that. Some days I'm not always writing in Python and my brain gets scrambled with too many languages. But this is how you do that. So we have an if and an else and we have the code block of line 14 and the code block of 16 and we get the correct answer. So let's keep going. More if else. Nested. This is really important. Nesting if and else and elif statements. Um, I do this all the time. Okay. Sometimes you want to basically cascade your knowledge. So if you have a choice, let's say a user has, um, let's say you're playing a game and the user has the choice of going north, south, east, or west. Now, I'm using a game and I'm using north, south, east, and west because this is what you're going to have to do when you write your game. So that's a user choice. And based on that user choice, maybe I'm going to do other things. Maybe I'm going to, if, if my choice is north, maybe I'm going to ask one set of questions and expect some answers as opposed to if it's west. Or maybe I'm going to check to see what's in my inventory. So nested statements are very important. Oh, no problem, Rochelle. I hope they're helpful. That's why I do them. Um, so I'm going to just do a little example for nested ifs. So I'm going to say nested. And I'm going to say, I'm going to have four directions. 
I'm going to have north. This is just a list, north, south, and we'll be doing more of this next week. So I can have north, south, east, west. Actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to scramble people's brains by doing that. What I'm going to say is input direction equals input. So I'm going to have some alternatives here. I'm going to say if if direction is north, I'm going to say um, I don't know amount equals. Greater than 10, print. Else. So I'm just going to do this really quick. Uh, wait a minute, I didn't do that right. All right, so this is just to demonstrate um, nested if statements. The nesting is right here. So I have if direction is north, and actually let me finish. I'm going to say L if direction is south. Um, beach time. So is so I'm introducing a few new things. What didn't I do yet? Uh, why can't I spell south? Let's see. D I is west. Okay. And then else. So here we have a couple different things going on, and I kind of did this all in one so you could see what nesting is and you could see what LIF statements are. First of all, I have, I've asked for a direction, north, south, east, or west. Those are my options. If I do anything else, then I want to say, sorry, it's invalid. You can't do anything. So let's test it for that condition. I'm going to start there. Let's edit the configuration. And I'm kind of showing you these complex statements because I want you to get used to complex statements. You're going to be introduced to them here, but you want to get the, the thought process going of branching because when you do your first flowchart and your first bit of pseudocode, you're going to have to concentrate on branching. So I want to get you guys thinking about asking these questions and, and getting the answers that you expect. So I'm saying 
enter a direction. If the direction is north, then I want someone to enter a distance. So the distance is greater than 10, then it's, you're going to go, it's going to be really cold, and otherwise you're going to head south. If you do not put in north, we're going to check to see if you put in south. If you put in south, you're going to go to the beach. If you put in east, you're going to go to New York City. If you put in west, you're going to go to California. Otherwise, it's an invalid input. So there's a whole lot going on here. But this is the kind of stuff you write when you're writing an algorithm and when you're writing your project. So I'm going to debug this. Actually, I'm going to start the debugger right there so that we can see what's happening in each run, except for the fact, what did I do? Oh, my bad. Equal, don't know why I typed the word is there. Ignore me. Okay. So now let's try it again. Stop and rerun. Much better. So I've said, please enter one of north, south, east, or west. I am going to enter, um, no thanks. And let's see what happens, OK? I've got the debugger going, so I'm in at the debugger. We will see over here that direction is no thanks. So what do we think will happen? Well, what I think will happen is I'm going to end up all the way down here, and I'm going to say invalid input. But let's double check that. So the direction is not north. It's not south. It's not east. It's not west. So I am going to have invalid input. This is important when you come to your project, because you're going to want to check for, you're going to want to validate your input. When it talks about validating your input, this is what you want. So if I do this again, and I put in north, you'll see that, and by the way, this is one of the reasons I like PyCharm. Way up here, it says direction is north. It tells you what you did. I can go to the debugger. I can see my direction is north. So north and north should be the same. So I'm going to step over, and now I'm in a code block. I'm inside the code block for the first if, and there are other ifs. So these are called nested if statements. So it's going to ask me for an amount. I'm going to go in. I'm going to go back to the console. You'll say it says enter distance, and I'm going to enter 11. So if I go back to the debugger, and if I look up here, I've entered 11. I know that I've entered 11. So I'm at 11 north. If I step over the if statement, whoops, I had an exception. What happened? Uh, is not supported. Oh, OK. I just did something wrong. And what I did wrong was I am treating amount as an integer without having converted it to an integer. Just my brain didn't work right for a second. So that's what's happening here. If you're seeing something called type error greater than or greater than not supported between instance of stir and int, it's because you're trying to treat a stir like an integer and you're not allowed to unless you do this. I need to convert it to an integer. That was last week, but that's what was going on right there. So I did not convert it to an integer. But that's how you solve that problem. If you talk, if it starts to talk about um, type errors and you're using it instead of one or the other, you need to do a type conversion. And that's what I needed to do. So let's do this again. I'm going to say north. OK. So I have I'm, my direction is north. I'm all good with that. I'm going to step into 5, which is the beginning of the code block. The code block for north goes from 5 to 9. Okay. So now I'm going to step over. It's going to enter the distance. I'm going to put in 11. 11 should be an integer now, and I should not get a type error. It is. And I step in to 7, and it's going to print. It's you know cold. 
and then I'm done. I'm completely finished. And that's because there's nothing else to do. When I get to this point, this is mutually exclusive for that, so it won't be run. And all of the rest of this will never be run because this was true. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about when it came to this longer thing is you can have lots of if, else, and else statements, and if, everything, it always has to start with an if. If you're asking a question, you have to start with an if. Only after that can you have else and else statements. And you cannot have multiple else. You can have multiple L if. So this is read if directions is north, then this is read else if direction is south. This is read else if direction is east, else if direction is west. When all else fails, do this. Now, that doesn't preclude me from doing something like this. The end. It will always make it to line 19 because it's outside any block. You will notice that this is not indented, which means to Python, do it. Just, just run the code. So when I do this, let me just put in south, except I can't spell, beach time and the end. I can put in north. north, 11, it's way too cold, and the end. So it's always going to get here. Now, one, and, and so when I'm outside of all of this, I can put a print statement that's left justified. I cannot, however, do this. This is wrong. First of all, PyCharm is going to give me all these beautiful red lines that say something is wrong. When you see something red like this in Python, it's telling you that you've got something out of place. And if I try and run it, I get this syntax error, invalid syntax. Now what a lot of students do is they're going to say, but there's nothing wrong with this statement. I don't understand why LF is wrong, why this LF statement is wrong. Well, there's nothing wrong with the LF statement. Oftentimes, when you are reading an error, especially a syntax error, you have to look backwards from where it's telling you the error is. So this line is perfectly fine. This line isn't. Now, if I just looked at it only as a line of Python, I would say there's nothing wrong with that. But when I look at it in the greater context of what I'm doing, with this whole chain of if-else statements, this breaks the chain. This breaks all of this relation because if is related to elif, 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 and else. So I have to get rid of this to make it work again. That's where the left justified and the indents become extremely important because this, is not the same as that. And you're going to get a bunch of red again. All I did was back was, was take out the tabs for these four lines and my program didn't work anymore. Because you have to be very conscious of what code block that piece of code is in. In this case, in the nested if, I want all my code to be under line four until I get to the L if. So line five, line six, and line eight have to be indented one because line seven is actually a code block for the nested if. It has to be indented one further. Just like line nine because it is the code block for the else at line eight, it has to be indented from the else one. 
So you have to be very, very careful with alignment with Python. Python is a great language. The alignment of it is one of the things that drives me nuts. Just does. So we're getting kind of late, so let me keep going. By the way, put any questions in the chat that you have, and I will try and get to them. Uh, wait a minute. What lab did you want? You wanted 3.13, right? Okay. So that means that you can't have ELIF as a nest. Well, you can, but you have to have an IF first. So let me do this really quick. So I have IF, and I can do here, I can do ELIF amount is uh, greater than 5 okay so I can have L if there I can say if amounts greater than 10 I'm going to print out it's a long way it's a long way in cold if amount is greater than 5 you won't freeze right away and else go south so I can have L if as part of this nested code block. What you cannot do is you can't have L if by itself. This is not valid Python. Um, Now you'll notice PyCharm has these wonderful red lines. Now the only thing I did was type in L if here. That's because you cannot have an L if statement without an if. Every, every series of questions has to start with an if. This is valid. This is not. Does that kind of answer your question? Cool. Cool. Okay. So let's keep going. Um, comparing character strings and floating point values. You can compare lots of things. And did I skip over? I think I may have skipped over something. Hold on. Okay. So equality operators. Sorry about that. I knew I skipped over it. When you've heard me speak before, I talk about assigning a variable, assigning a value to a variable. And we know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And I talk about single equal signs because there's a difference between a single equal sign and a double equal sign. The double equal sign talks about equivalence. Are two things the same? Or are two things not the same if you have not equals, which is just the exclamation point and equals. So what Python is doing is it's comparing one thing to another and saying, are these the same? Or it's comparing one thing to another and saying, are they not the same? So this is where the double equal comes in. And this is where you will have either a true or a false. And this is important because a lot of students, when they're first doing branching, have a lot of trouble understanding the whole double equal sign versus single equal sign. Single equal sign is an assignment. It is saying, take this piece of information and give it a name. Double equal sign is saying equivalent. Are two things the same? And it can be very confusing at first, but there are, but, but you will not use, or you almost never use, a single equal sign in um, a branch, in a decision. You will always use single or double equal signs or not equal or less than or equal in a Boolean expression. And that's what this is saying. And what this is, is it's saying, is A the same as B? 
or it can be more correctly read as A is the same as B, true or false. Because you only have two answers. You have true or false. And then we're going to talk a little bit about compound if statements, and that gets a little bit trickier. Um, hold on. You also have what they call relational operators. It's something less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. And that is basically saying it's not checking for equivalence, it is checking for relation. So is 5 less than 4? Or, more correctly spoken, if you're talking in Python, 5 is less than 4, true or false. Well, what I just said is false. 5 is not less than 4. 4 is less than 5, true or false. Well, that's a true statement. So that is what relational operators, they look at the left-hand side of the operator and the right-hand side of the operator, and they compare it and say, okay, are these things, um, how do these two things relate to each other? And it's, you, you can, it, it, it's logic. You can talk about something making logical sense. This makes logical sense or it doesn't make logical sense. If you're thinking about something, if you're thinking about two numbers and you know that 10 is less than 11, Python is going to know the same thing. So it's just, it's logically what makes sense. Okay, let's keep going. Boolean operators. So, true and false. Um, true and false are great until you have to go in and and not, and or and not. So you can combine statements. Right now, if I look at my pie chart, wait a minute. And what is a triple equal sign? Oh, I'd have to go look that up. I never use a triple equal sign. Um, well, that's not true. In JavaScript, I use a triple equal sign. But in Python, I never use a triple equal sign. So I'll have to go look that up. Sorry about that. Um, so these are not compound statements. So if I say direction is the same as north, that's just a single statement. I have one left-hand side and one right-hand side. Now, if I'm going, let me, let me create a new file, and we'll do some compound statements. Um, so I'm going to have two inputs. I'm going to have um, var1 is and then I'm going to have another one var2 is enter another, another integer. So now what am I going to do? I'm going to use a compound statement. I'm going to say if var1 is, whoops, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the challenge that we do this with. I think that will make more sense. So Write an expression using Boolean operators that print special number if special num is minus 99, 0, or 44. Sample output with 17, not a special number. Hmm. Okay, this will work. So we're just going to do this right here as for compound statements. I think that will be more relevant. So let's do this. Oops. Okay. So they want to write an expression using a Boolean operator that prints special number if special num is minus 99, 0, or 44. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm, what does it give us? It gives us this. So they actually give us most of this. So this is what they give us. So we're going to input special num and they say your solution goes here. This is going to be a compound statement. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to use and or ors. And in this case I'm going to use and. So I'll show you what I mean I'm going to do and then we'll go back and double check. So I'm going to say if special num is minus 99 or special num is 0 or special num is the same as 44, then print special number. Now what in the world did I just do? I created a compound statement. Okay? The compound statement is multiple statements either anded or ORed together. So you'll notice I only have special num. It's all I, the only variable I input. I am told that I have three special numbers, minus, minus, minus 99, 0, or 44. So what I want to do is on one line, I want to check special num for three different values. The way I'm doing that is I am creating a compound statement. So let's take this compound statement and look at it in each of its piece parts. The left hand, so I have three statements. I have one, two, and three statements, okay? Each separated by an or. Special, the first statement is special num is well, special num is the same as minus 99, true or false. The second statement is special num is 0, true or false. And the third statement is special num is 44, true or false. Now, you'll notice that each time I needed to check something, I had to type in special num. Okay? This is its own statement to Python. This is its own statement. So it has to be complete. You can't just say special num is 99 or 0 or 44. It won't work. You have to have special num in there. So, uh, and I'll show you what the error would be in a second. So this is a compound statement. And let's just run this really quick. Okay, so when I run this, I'm going to put in minus 99, okay? And I have a special number. That's great. I'm going to run this again, and I'm going to put in 42, and that's not a special number. So this works. Now, what was I saying? Let me show you what is a common mistake a lot of new programming students make. This is the common mistake. Okay. Right here. Students will make the mistake where they're just going to say, well, special num, it's going to be 99 or 0 or 44. This won't work. If I run this and I put in minus 99, we saw this work before. Um, Hold on. I don't know what PyCharm is doing. Let me put in zero. Hmm. I don't know why this is working. It shouldn't. I have no clue why this is working. It should not be doing that unless Python has changed. Anyway, this is the correct way to do it, right up here. I have to go back and figure out what I did. Anyway, I'm sorry, my brain is frying. It gets too close to 11. So um, this is how you do a compound statement. Why did I use ORs? I used ORs 
because it could have been any of them. If I had used ands, which is the other way to do compound statements, it wouldn't have made any sense. If I had done and, this would have never worked. It would have been special num has to be minus 99, and it has to be 0, and it has to be 44 before anything works. So we would never actually get to special number. So if I ran it this time and I put in minus 99, minus 99 is all of a sudden not a special number. It is not a special number because the only thing I did was change it from or to and. So let's go back and look at the compound table up here really quick now that we've had a demonstration. So you have two Boolean operators. Sorry, you have three, and, or, and not. Okay? And these tables are important. They look originally a little confusing, but they're important. So what they're doing is they're showing you what happens if you combine something. So I have A and I have B. Here is my Boolean operator. So my Boolean operator is AND. So if I say if A is false and B is false, the result is always false. If A is false and B is true, the result is always false. If A is true and B is false, the result is always false. If A is true and B is true, the result is always true. So with an AND, it's always false unless all parts of the compound statement are true. That's the way I remember it. If they're all true, then it's true. If they're not all true, then it's always false. Or is the opposite. So here I have A and B, and it's the relational operator, sorry, the Boolean operator is an OR. So if A is false or B is false, then it's false. If A is false or B is true, then it's true. The reverse is the same. If A is true and B is false, then it's true when you're using an OR. And if A is true or B is true, it's true. Not is the opposite. So if A is false and you say not A, it becomes true. So you can look for something that's not minus 99 or not 44. So you can get very complex statements very, very quickly. If you are starting to have problems with complex statements, my suggestion is always start simple, baby steps. Get that first thing working and then add the next part of the compound statement. Do not try and write a very long complex compound statement the first go around because it is going to uh, cause headaches. Baby steps are important. Um, so let's see, membership and identity operators in. So they're talking some about um, membership and identity operators. And basically what they're saying is if you have a list, you can use this special operator called in. And it, instead of having to go through a list, it will simply say is my value part of this list. And you're going to need this for one of the challenges. So when they're starting, if they're talking about entering a list or using the split function, and they're, look, they're asking you, does something exist in a list, you want to use the in operator. If they're asking you if something does not exist in a list, you want to use not in. Uh, Order and evaluation. It's basically mathematical order and evaluation. Okay. Parentheses change the order. Um, so parentheses are always primary. And then, you know, multiply, division, modulation, addition, subtraction, those are the next ones. Uh, less than, less than, or equal to the relational operators, not, and, and, or. So if you're you have, to, you have to understand the order of precedence if you're writing long, complex statements. You probably won't need them for what we're doing in this chapter. 
you may need to understand these better when you get to your problem. So code blocks and indentation. I already talked about code blocks and indentation. Conditional expressions. We um, have talked about conditional expressions. We've been doing that the whole time. Um, the, a conditional expression has three operands, and thus is sometimes referred to as a tertiary operator. I don't use these very much. Uh, I, I don't find them readable. You can use them if you want. They're valid, very valid in Python. Basically, they're a shorthand. I am old-fashioned. I will always use this, this form of uh, conditional expression. Some people prefer this form of conditional expression. One is not more correct than the other. Okay, so additional practice, which, and which one did you want? We're going to go over a little, and I apologize. 42, see if a number that isn't special would work. That, yeah. I, I don't know why that one, that one should have given me a syntax error. I will have to go back and look. Okay, 3.13, we're going to go, and we're going to walk through it. I'm not going to actually write all the code. But we're going to go through ah the exact change one. This one can really uh, really throw students off, and that's because you're asking to use the floor operator. Did I miss one? Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna do something similar to this. We're, we're not gonna solve the whole problem. So Python file, 3.13, and what we're going to do is we're going to input an amount. Uh, okay. I'm going to input an amount, and then I want to see how many, let's say I want to see, well, how many dollars are in that amount. So, now here we're going to use something called the floor operator. So what I want to do is I'm going to go out to the internet, and I'm going to say Python floor operator. Python is one of the few, um, there we go, floor division. Python is one of the few programming languages that has this type of operator. So floor division basically says um, the, the integral part of the quotient. That doesn't make a lot of sense. But basically what you're doing is you're returning the whole number. So Instead of it being 2.5, it would be 2. So if I, did I miss, there we go, sorry. My code keeps running. The input value comes out as the number of cents in each type of coin instead of calculating what the amount is in coins. Example, I input 100, I get $1, 4 quarters, 10 dimes. Okay, so let's, let's start by taking a look at this. Um, so what I want to do is I want to see how many dollars are in the amount. So I'm going to say num dollars is going to be um, amount for 100. So I'm just going to run this really quick and see what happens. Okay, so so I'm going to put in 125 and I get zero. Did I do that right? Uh, amount. Whoops, did I have my syntax right? Oh, my syntax, my, my bad, my complete bad. 
Okay. So it should have been zero. I'm going to put in 125 pennies, and I get one. Perfect. That's what I expect to get. So now I have, if I want to find out the number of quarters, then what I have to do is I have to subtract the number of dollars minus times 100 minus the amount. So I'm going to now have, I'm going to have amount equals, is that going to work? Probably. Um, amount minus num dollars times 100. And then I'm going to say num quarters is amount 25. So then I'm going to print num quarters. So now let's see what happens. I'm going to print 125 and I get 1 and 4. So something didn't go right. So amount to, okay, 125, okay, so amount to is amount, oh, my bad, not equals, minus. That was complete operator error, it was between the keyboard and the chair, I'm going to put 125, and then I get 1 and 1, so let's get rid of that, that, that. So let's just make it a little easier. So if I run this, I'm going to put in 125 again, and the number of dollars is 1, and the number of quarters is 1. So that is how you use the floor operator, and that is how you solve this problem. Does this answer your question, Valerie? I think so. Okay. And don't be sorry for a really long chat. It, um, it's okay. Um, so, and I don't think you're in my class, Valerie, or I would tell you to send me your code. But be, if, you're, if you're in my class, if any of you are in my class, and you are trying code and you're having problems, send me your code, and I will give you hints to help you move forward to get your lap right. Okay? Um, if you're not, I can't make that, um, I can't make that offer to you. So let's go back and read a little bit more to make sure we have everything. So first of all, if the input is zero, you want no change. So this is an if statement. So if I input zero, the first thing I want to do is check the amount. If the amount is, the, is zero, then I'm going to print no change, and I'm going to exit the program. I'm done. Otherwise, I need to print out the number of quarters, the number of dimes, the number of dollars, the number of nickels. Um, and by the way, this is important because in a couple of uh, a couple of modules, you're going to use this code and do a whole other lab. So you want to try and get it right. But um, there's, there are going to be some if statements, okay? The first thing is to check it. So remember when I was talking about invalid in that other code? Well, here you want to check the validity first. You're going to say, 
if it's greater than zero, do all this other stuff, else print no change, okay? And then to actually figure out the amount of change, you're going to want to use the floor operator, just like this. So if I'm checking out the dollars, I'm doing a floor with 100. If I'm checking out the quarters, I'm doing a floor with 25. After I subtract the number of, of dollars that I've taken. So this should work if I also do it for $2.45. So I have $2 and I still have one quarter. I didn't get it to 50. If I do it for $2.50, sorry, two fifty, then I have $2 and two quarters. So this works for different values. So I know I'm pretty sure I'm on the right track. So what you need to do is do the same thing except for also dimes, nickels, and pennies. So you have three more values you have to do. And you have to check your input. Always check your input. So I know I've gone over a few minutes. Does anybody have any more questions? Okay, I'm going to say that's a no. So I'm going to call it. I'm going to stop the recording. This will be up on my YouTube channel most likely tomorrow morning. And for those who are not in my for those who are in my class, I will post an announcement. For those who are not in my class, I will send the announcement to the teacher, but it, you can always look at the YouTube channel if your teachers have sent you something already, and it'll be up there under um, Module 3 and also 21EW6. So have a good evening, everyone, and um, if you're in my class, reach out to me if you, you need to.